My name is Eric Robinson. I'm the scholarly communications librarian for the university. Um, today we're going to talk about open data. Um, I've put together a couple of different presentations on this topic. Um, another, I have another one that's a little more geared toward really carefully crafting uh, a data sharing plan. Um, this one is more of an introduction to open data. So we'll we'll define what we mean by open data. Um, it's really just the that sort of extra level of transparency of sharing your collected data from your research online, um, either for people to to view and read and you know verify your analysis, um, but potentially also to take that data and incorporate it into additional studies. Um, and we'll talk about open licenses and how that facilitates all that, particularly with regard to um, scholarly recognition and things like that. Um, but but that's that's really what we're talking about when we talk about open data. Um, we'll talk about the benefits of that and and how to utilize specific research data planning tools that kind of let you um, make a plan for sharing your data and making your data available um, in terms of the licenses that you provide to it. Um, the locations online where you might publish that data um, and, what, and what that might look like. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, scholarly repositories in general, our own SOAR at USA as, as a possible venue uh, for sharing your, your own open data. Um, but hopefully you'll come away from this um, with a good understanding of, of the benefits and why, why you might want to share your data or why you might be required to share your data under certain funding plans, um, grant funding, and that sort of thing might might constrain you and and require that you that you follow some of the things that we're talking about today. Um, so yeah, um, <clears throat> open data is really just part of the open science movement. So there's been since the advent of the internet. That always sounds so weird to say, um, but since particularly in recent decades after the internet has really caught on and research has been made more and more widely available, um, there have been moves to open open up not only access to the material, um, but to make that, that material more available, um, more easily reachable by individuals who might need to consult that data. Um, but other movements as part of that to enable reuse, redistribution, um, and capitalize on the that networking ability to share that information and, and enable end users to not only view the data itself or the science or the research or the methodologies, whatever it is that you might be sharing, but then to uh, then to then to co-opt that information or that data and utilize it in new and useful ways. Um, it definitely that universal barrier-free participation and being able to access the information is, is at the core of that. Um, but there are other tangential benefits of transparency, uh, being able to you know, verify that when someone publishes a paper saying that they've done a study that finds X, Y, or Z, that individuals can go to the data itself. And, and not only verify the analysis, and but also you know utilize that data to perform additional studies and, and things like that. So that's that's kind of what's at the heart of of open science in general. Um, open data is really just a fraction, um, a small sliver of that of that whole pie. Um, open data, particularly, um, comes into play with publicly funded research. Um, as part of the open science movement, as part of um, open access in general, there's been a really strong push, particularly when research is funded at the federal, state, institutional, um, some sort of publicly funded level. There's been a push to make the, the research and the data available to the public. Um, historically, and currently even to, to a significant extent, that research has been kind of locked behind subscription walls, paywalls, article access fees for access to the research itself. Um, and certainly the data itself would be, would be deeply hidden as well. But um, 
as part of this movement, if if a net, if a federal funding source has has given you grant funding, there's a strong argument that any individual receiving that federal grant funding um, ought to make that work available to the public who has paid for the research, um, rather than having things hidden behind subscription walls or patent or copyright protections and things like that. Um, so that that democratic access to the data that the public has paid for is a huge part of open data. Um, as I mentioned before, the research transparency and, and integrity of the research process. Um, open data encourages verifiability, encur encourages um, duplication, um, replication of analysis, and that sort of thing. Um, the more widely the data itself becomes available through university repositories, through public registries of data collection sets, then there's a strong reduction of the duplicated effort of data collection, right? If I'm if I'm planning a study um, of seniors and fall prevention uh, in particular um, settings or whatever that might be, it I can I can search the uh, as just as I would do a literature search of the available studies that have been published in terms of research articles, I can also search data sets and, and see what additional data sets might be um, available that I might either add to my own research, my own data collection, um, to get to potentially increase the sample size um, if that data maps properly or I can make that data map properly. Um, so it can rapidly reduce that duplicated data collection which sort of increases the pace of science, right? If we're not having 50 different studies all duplicating the same data collection process, that labor, that effort can go more into analysis, into additional study design, and, and additional findings. So that sort of accelerates progress and innovation in science. So that's, that's all kind of part of the motivation. Um, when we talk about defining open data itself, we can kind of think about it in, in a couple of different ways. Um, I like to contrast legally open versus usably open, right? So you can post your data on, on the web and tell people that they're allowed to use it, attach, potentially attach a license to it that tells them that they can incorporate this data. You could make it as open as possible from that legal licensing standpoint, but if they're not able to actually get or find or extract the information that you've published online, um, then it's not necessarily particularly usable. So um, we not only want to define the permissions that enable legal use of open data, but also provide file types, provide data in formats that people can access, can extract from, um, can make sense of in terms of um, column headings in an Excel sheet or whatever that might be um, to make that data more usable. And there have been, as, as, this, as I said, this is a fairly huge movement and there have been a lot of kind of best practice efforts geared toward um, not only making it legally open, but usably open. And when we get to that usable side, uh, we talk about the FAIR principles, and this was um, out, of a, out of a focus group um, that got together and, and tried to lay out some principles uh, that would inform practitioners in making their data open so that that data would be as usable as possible. And the FAIR is just an acronym. It stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So the findability part really gets at the library side of things, right? Having, um, choosing a, an appropriate registry, cataloging that data with enough information that somebody can, can find that either through a search engine or um, a data index or something like that. Accessible gets very much at the usable side that we talked about, being able to um, not only get to the data and, and access it and use, utilize it legally, but also to be able to extract from it. Uh, you can 
a really good example, and I think I go into this a little bit later, is if I put uh, an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet online and where I've got my columns and, and rows all laid out for my 200,000 data points that I might have in a particular study, if I were to publish that in a PDF, uh, which is just essentially, and well, there's a couple different ways to do that, but let's say, let's say I just did it as a sort of photo image of a table, right, versus the actual cell-based table in Excel, then you can see how the latter is much more accessible, right? I can, I'm able to pull a column from that fairly easily, where if it's an image of a table um, in, in a PDF file or, or even a photo file, uh, you can see that that's much harder to extract that data from. Um, certainly in terms of automated extraction and you know programming, uh, programmed extraction and things like that is a whole other story. Um, but I think that contrast makes that accessibility um, point pretty well. You know, the, the PDF is, or the photo table is very low on the usability side and a CSV file or an Excel file um, would be very high on the usability. Um, interoperability kind of kind of gets at the same thing. Um, being able to, to transfer that information from various formats and, and import it into a new um, into a new program or a new file. So the 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 more accessible and I shouldn't say accessible because that's our A, the more easily one can move that data from one analytical program or viewing program to another, the more interoperable it is. And then reusability, again, sort of blurs over the interoperable side, but also gets at being able to make sense of that data, right? If I'm the only one that knows what the, what the column headings in my Excel file mean, then people aren't, get, aren't going to be able to reuse that data very well. Um, so one of the things that we'll talk about in a, in a data management plan is getting at a clear explication of how your data has been collected, what the various um, units of measurement might have been. Um, you know, if we're talking about gender, are we only using two genders or are we using a wider, um, wider definition of gender identity? Um, and mapping that in a way that is clear in its organization, but also communicated clearly to the user so that they can take that data and reuse it. Okay, any questions about that? All right. So um, getting to the opening data up, um, it's, it's, very, it's a very easy thing to do to take a couple of simple steps. And I think that's kind of where I would like to take anybody viewing this presentation is get, how can I take that first step toward um, an open data practice? And, and you can start very simple. Just look at a single data set that you might have in, um, in, one of your re in a recent project that you might have done. Is there a data set that, that you could easily um, put online and put in, a, in SORA USA, which is our um, university open access repository? Um, could you could you easily screen that data and make make it useful in the ways that we just talked about? So every open set of data that we that we put online that we make accessible is going to increase that access and put a grain in the put a grain on the on the side of the scale that's accelerating scientific progress. Uh, that sounds kind of high minded, but really really that is uh, very much very much at the core of what we're doing here. Um, understand. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Understand that not every data set may be useful. So when you're choosing a data set to make make publicly available, um, you know if it's if it's a very niche thing, you know who knows who might be able to use that that niche type data. Um, but understanding that there are certain data sets that might not be as useful for others, and, and selecting the ones that at least as much as you're able to envision, uh, might be able to be most widely incorporated. And that could be, a, a, you know, in terms of the FAIR principles that we discussed, you know, what, what data you have that might meet some of that FAIR criteria. So it's not just a matter of the topic, 
Um, it's very much a matter of, of how useful whichever set you choose might be, how, how fair and, and interoperable and accessible that might be. So think when you're thinking about that, try to give some thought to potential users and, and who might find uh, which data sets the most useful and, and how, which ones might get the most wide use. Um, but any any single set is going to, as I said, is going to increase that access and, and um, put a grain on the on the scale on that side. So I know we've talked about open licenses in previous webinars, but um, this this is very much at the core here because not only are you sharing that data, um, you're really getting at um, addressing how people are able to take that data and reuse it. So if you're putting it online, just because you put it online doesn't mean anyone has permission to, to use that information. Uh, but if you can, um, and you can, you have the intellectual property side of that in your favor and you can, you can license that data, um, meaning that you can make it available for people to use, then, then you can apply what we call an open license. And there's, there's various open licenses here. We'll discuss a couple um, in a little bit of detail in a minute. Um, but before you do that, we kind of need to give consideration to a couple of things, right? Um, certainly, is this your intellectual property to be able to share? Um, if you're working for um, a corporation, large research corporation, where your work is their property, or a university that, that makes claim to any intellectual property that comes out of your work at the university, um, then you may want to make sure that you have have the permission of the individuals or the entities and institutions involved. Um, certainly, HIPAA identification is a huge factor, particularly in health science research data. So um, there are standard methods of screening. Um, I think we all get deep education in what information is HIPAA protected. And, and giving those considerations to privacy as as a first step before you before you try to open up uh, particularly health science data is a critical critical element. Um, <clears throat> when you're applying an open license, think about the fair principles that we talked about and and our definition of open being able to not only access that information um, but reuse it, repurpose it potentially, uh, and and choosing a license that. If your goal is to make that data open and enable the reuse of it, be sure that you choose a license, whether that's a Creative Commons license or something else um, that meets that definition of open because you want to, gener in general, you want to make that um, information as usable as possible. And, and understand and approach your selection of data with the idea in mind that certain data sets may not qualify. There may just be, um, maybe that data is almost entirely HIPAA protected information that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to screen and de-identify and share in a way that, uh, that, that, would meet the, that would meet the HIPAA standards. Or as I said, um, there might be copyright and intellectual property constraints on on the situation in which that data was created that might not allow that. So not all data sets will qualify to, to be open, uh, but they're typically, uh, particularly in, in university research and grant funded research and things like that, um, there are pathways through what might seem like intellectual property issues. Um, and I would be available to help anyone navigate those, those questions as well. So open licenses themselves, we've sort of alluded to, but to get very specific about them, really what they boil down to is slapping some sort of indicator on the web page, on the data set, on whatever document might be released that gives some sort of advanced pre-specified license permission that tells the user if they come across that, are they allowed to share it? Are they allowed to repurpose it? adapt it, modify it in any way, um, and, and what it is essentially that you're allowing permission for them to do with that data. So that, that's really what is at the heart of the open licenses. Typically, these will be very open and you know encourage people to reuse and repurpose that data 
um, under the most open like CC by Creative Commons licenses, which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Um, typically, they'll be very open and encourage that reuse, but require some sort of public attribution. Um, typically, that's acknowledgement, citation of, of the work itself, um, an indication of the license under which it was accessed and utilized, and, and linking back to the original source. Um, that's, I, that linking back, I think, sometimes gets a little bit of short shrift because a lot of researchers are very much in the citation mindset, not necessarily in, um, in the shared linking mindset. So I, I talk a little bit about um, kind of an anatomy of a license in a minute, but I just wanted to point to a couple of um, sort of standards. Uh, I think Creative Commons is, <coughs> excuse me, becoming incredibly widely used. Um, and that's the one that I will focus on. I think it's the easiest to understand and the easiest to utilize. But um, the Open Knowledge Foundation has put together an open data license um, that that also that does very similar things, but is a bit more geared toward data itself. Um, it, as I said, it's I don't think it's quite as ubiquitous or as easy to use. So I'm not going to focus on that too much. I, but I did want to point it out as a potential source of investigation. And then the open government license is kind of um, the UK version of that, where um, that meets their their particular federal grant funding, um, sort of takes that the UK grant funding and licensing into account. Um, so those are some pretty widely used ones. I'm gonna focus on the CC, the Creative Commons license. You've probably seen some sort of little graphic indicator of the of the Creative Commons license somewhere. If you haven't seen it before, you'll probably start see, now that you have seen it, it's like when you buy a red Honda, you start to see red Hondas everywhere. Um, you, you will hopefully see these um, very visibly as, as you go forward. Um, but I wanted to kind of lay out what I how I described that that attribution and that linkage. So I think of this as the anatomy of what I would put in if I were citing a source or if I were um, incorporating that information. And this could go in some introductory material, um, like the title page or the um, sort of uh, introductory page to the data set on the on the web page itself, potentially, if you're if you're incorporating additional data. And also when you're releasing your data, how you indicate those those controls, those licenses, those permissions. So really, you want to kind of title the original work and potentially link back to the work itself. So I just have data set here, um, and I've got a link attached to that that takes me to Sora USA. But that could that could easily take me to an to an individual um, actual data set um, somewhere. Oops, that is not what I meant to do. Um, the other the other link that I've got is for the creators themselves. Um, that you could theoretically also link uh, to the original source. Um, I find it useful to connect that to some sort of um, connection to the researcher themselves if I have that available. Um, ORCID IDs, if you're familiar with those, is sort of a scholarly identification, sort of a virtual CV. Um, that's a good place to link to the creators if, if you have that information. Um, if not, you can certainly, uh, you can certainly link to the, um, sorry, link to the uh, original data set, the original source page, whatever that might be. And then of course you wanna um, connect the user to the license that's being used at some point. So um, here I have a link to the CC BY license itself. Um, there may be conditions of a particular license that, that require me, um, to make other constraints, and, and I would want to indicate those as, as well. If they're if, usually under a CC BY license, if there's been any modification made to the original information source, um, any adaptations that were made, those those might need to be specified as well. Uh, but the that basic kind of setup of you know the clear indicator that icon isn't necessary isn't necessarily used, uh, but I think that indicates to everyone very clearly. And then a little bit of text with the with the links and things um, is kind of the standard operating procedure for utilizing those licenses. And as I said, um, you can slap that on the title page of of uh, 
a paper, if it's a publication, you can slap it on the, on the page, on the landing page. Um, if you've got a number of files downloadable from, from a data set homepage, uh, let's say, you know, you have a particular study that has seven different files associated with it. You land on the, on the page, the record page for the, for that data set. And then the individual file files are downloadable from that, from that page. Um, you could slap this at the top of that page near the title of the data set. And it would be clear to any anyone who stumbles across that set what they're allowed to do with it and what what they're required uh, to indicate if they do utilize that. So that's the basics of a CC BY um, of a Creative Commons license. There are other licenses um, available, um, share alike, non commercial that place additional constraints on those. Um, but particularly since we're looking at opening up data. Um, and making that more useful. I'm not, I'm not spending time on some of those more constrained, less free versions of the Creative Commons license. I'm sticking to the, to the very open side because that's the purpose of this particular lecture. I do do a lecture on Creative Commons specifically that you might be interested in checking out. Um, it's available through the library archives or um, the iLearn archives if it gets in. I don't think it's in there yet, but it will be. Uh, but that goes into much more detail about all the various elements, um, including the more restrictive licenses with, with CC. Um, other considerations um, that you that kind of you kind of want to go into um, your consideration of your selection of your license, your use of your license. Um, I've alluded to some of these previously, uh, particularly the employer policies. You know you your work may be the intellectual property of that institution under certain um, contracts and things. Um, so there's that to be aware of. Uh, third party rights, if you're utilizing information, let's say you've, you're releasing a data set, um, but you've incorporated someone else's data set as part of that, um, those third party rights, the, the rights of the person whose work you're utilizing, may constrain your own selection. So um, I alluded I alluded at the beginning of my, sorry, I have a cat. <laughs> uh, I alluded at the beginning of my um, lecture to the share alike license. And that essentially says that if I'm using someone someone's information and they have a share alike license on it, that means I'm allowed to use their their work as long as I also share my work under a similar license. So that's the kind of thing that might might come into play with the third party materials. Um, they, they may be very free and really only require some sort of attribution acknowledgement and, and license indication um, that you're utilizing it under, let's say, the CC BY license. Um, but there could be more, more rigorous constraints. Um, the top of that list, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, I apologize for that, but the top of that list, I think, um, if, if you are, are planning on doing anything as, uh, let's say, for-profit business goals or anything like that, if something is released under, under, a, under an open license, um, anyone who comes across that information can share that under an open license, and it's kind of part of that everything on the internet is forever kind of kind of mentality that even if you were to pull that license from your original posting um, there's the potential that there are still pieces of that floating around that still have the original open license attached to it um, so in it, it, there is there is a sense of irre irrevocability in that sense that that could go up against any business goals you might have with intellectual property or something like that. So something al something also to be aware of. Um, I do mention the attribution stacking. Um, that's kind of a jargon term that really gets to incorporating data sets that have incorporated data sets that have incorporated data sets. So you get to a, a, a strange point where <laughs> Um, it can it can get a little confusing when you're utilizing a data set that's utilizing someone else's data set uh, and and you get these sort of chains of license recognition and and sifting those out and making sure that you're that that your intermediate source is also utilizing the appropriate license and and tracking tracking that stack of, of license attribution 
to make sure that you're adhering can can get a little tricky. So um, there's there are those considerations. Um, getting to the accessibility side of things, um, there's a couple things that that you can do to keep that that work as as openly accessible as possible. Um, when you publish your data, um, you may you may be publishing data, you know, you'll that let's say a data set that has some 15 files. Um, if they're all part of a single data collection project and they belong together in, in a very real sense, it's typically best to publish that data in bulk as part of that research project. You can describe what the individual files are, um, but they'll they'll most likely make sense and be sort of distinguishable um, as part of the, the data collection project whole. Um, pointing to those, describing those uh, in, in some detail is certainly a part of, of the publication process. Um, but if you were to sort of salami slice those out, sort of one little data file at a time, then they become sort of detached from, from the project and don't necessarily, uh, aren't, aren't, aren't as cohesive between them between the files, right? So if you've got five different files that have been released at five different times, the way that the files themselves relate to each other within that project gets lost. So publishing um, the data sets in bulk, you know, in that way, um, I think is typically the best way to go. There may be exceptions to that. Um, choosing the format in which you release those files. Um, we talked about the accessibility and interoperability um, when we briefly discussed the FAIR principles, but utilizing a format that, that people are able to extract information from in a useful way um, that they will be able to get to. Um, if, you, if you, let's say you release uh, data from an SPSS, data set and you only re released it in the SPSS format, uh, that's the statistical analysis software if you're not familiar, then I can't necessarily access that data unless I have SPSS, which is a fairly expensive um, statistical analysis program. But if SPSS allows me to export that data as a CSV file or as an Excel format or something that's maybe a little more approachable, um, then more people are going to be able to get to that data. So choose a, a useful format when you're when you're sharing that data so that it is so that it is accessible. Um, I talked about the the common platforms and the and the machine accessible side of things. Like I made that comparison of an Excel spreadsheet to a PDF um, sort of photo image of a table, um, and utilizing those more common platforms and data that is structured in a way. Uh, that at least at least theoretically someone could could write a program to extract data from an Excel file um, where that would be almost impossible to do from from a PDF uh, photo table like I discussed before uh, so making making sure that you're taking those things into consideration is going to improve the accessibility of, of your of your data all along the way discoverability or findability um, this is the, the F in our FAIR principles, really. Um, certainly publishing them, publishing the data on the web is, is the first step in that, right? To make that discoverable, that somebody's going to be able to, to reach that data. Um, but utilizing effective metadata, that is data information that describes the data set, that, uh, that describes your column headings and the units in which you've collected your data and, and um, enables the user to make sense of that data and also for other indexes to to point to and make that information more findable so if you have a data set with a project heading um, and it just has the name of your project and the authors and then a bunch of data files um, that's somewhat findable uh, but if you have metadata that sort of catalogs and describes that you have an abstract for the data collection you have a brief um, description of, of each data file and what it contains and, and the type of information that was collected, you can see how 
someone using Google or um, a, one of the index data indexes that might might be out there, they're going to be much more able to get to do a more fine grained search of the type of data that might be there, um, as opposed to if you just had a, a title of your project and the authors. Um, utilizing the index services and registries, there are, there are um, you can register your data set in various locations. Um, describing that information, if, if you publish in something like Sora USA, there are networks um, of indexing across the, the digital commons network. So in other institutions that are using similar platforms to Sora USA will in, can index and share each other's information. Uh, utilizing enough information and enough and registering your your data sets in enough locations that that people are able to to search out and discover your material is is a key part of the of the findability aspect. When you're choosing a repository, um, let's say you're 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 trying to you you've gotten with your publisher, you've gotten with your grant funder, um, and they've they've told you that you need to make your data available. Um, there are lots of options available to you, but there, if, you, if you're really looking to keep things open and enable that reuse, there's a couple of essential criteria and a couple of, let's call them more optional or desirable criteria, things that you would like if you can, but, but, not necess but they aren't absolutely critical to the mission of, of open data. Among the essential criteria, um, certainly some ability to convey clear access and reuse indications. So um, basically that boils down to our open licenses. Um, are we able to clearly indicate and convey what we need to convey about our licenses um, through whatever that, wherever you're depositing that data, does that enable you to do that? And certainly um, Sora USA and most institutional repositories will allow that. Um, Zenodo is something online that does a good job of that. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Um, but you want to make sure that wherever you're putting your data, you're able to clearly indicate that and potentially even you know spotlight it so that so that users aren't misled or confused about what they're allowed to do with that. The worst thing that you can do is put data, <coughs> excuse me, online. Let's say there are ways to do this more in line with what we're talking about, but let's say I just decide to post my data set on my personal web page, uh, but I don't give any indication of those things. If someone comes across that, you get two, two possible scenarios, right? They can either not find any indication of access and reuse and choose to not utilize it, in which case, what's the purpose of, of making it available? Or they can come across it and decide to use it, but make a wrong decision. And, and utilize it in a way that you didn't intend for it to be used, but you didn't give them any indication of that. Um, they would be in the wrong for that, certainly, um, but, but you're, you're sort of encouraging that mis, misuse or miscommunication if you're, if you're putting it there but not being clear about what's, what's allowed to be done. Um, the other thing is, and I think the Creative Commons are excellent, the Creative Commons licenses are excellent at this, is not requiring any access request or approval request, uh, request approval process, right? It's so much easier if you come across something, it has a clear indication of the licensing, it has a Creative Commons right there that indicates exactly what I'm able to do, as opposed to me having to locate some individual and try to come up, try to describe what I want to do and get the, get their permission and maybe not even be able to reach them. So if you can do away with that approval process through those advanced permission type licenses that we discussed, that's going to make your data much more usable and easier for the easier for the user to use. Um, data preservation policies, um, many of the repositories may hold that data for a given length of time. You may need to encourage, you, you, you may be required to make it available for a given period, depending on your consent policies with your, with your patients. Um, you may say that the data will only be retained 
for a year. Um, so if you if you did make that available, you would need to to be able to to pull that data at whatever given time um, that coincides with your with your informed consent, um, and and potentially also uh, anyone who's accessing that data, making it clear that it's that it can only be used beyond a certain date. Uh, so those things are are an element of that as well. Um, most data repositories, Zenodo, SOAR, um, university repositories, will also assign a DOI um, for the data set. And that, that's good for a couple of different reasons. One, it sort of facilitates the citation and, um, and attribution side of, of data, data set reuse. Um, but a, another side, another kind of less familiar side of DOIs is that it, it maintains the link to that data. So let's say you posted your data on SOAR at USA, um, but three years down the line, SOAR at USA, or the university changes ownership, um, the, the website, the web platform that we post in SOAR at USA changes its, changes its location, it's now hosted on a different server with a different, with a different web address. All of these things can complicate finding, finding that data. If you've got a DOI registered, then what's going to happen is you can you can visit or search that DOI, and regardless of where the data or the publication gets moved to regarding servers and online locations, the DOI is going to point to whatever new location um, that data ends up in. So if you were to share the original URL, that URL, that web address might go defunct, but through the DOI, we can point to the new web location and that makes that data more persistently available um, and, and more persistently citable so that users can get back to it even after it might may have changed hands or changed location. So that's a, a kind of a little less familiar side of DOIs, but, but a critical one uh, for scholarly infrastructure. So those are the really truly essential criteria um, for anyone who wants to share their data, regardless of where they're putting it, even if it's on their personal website, you want to make sure that those things are all taken into account. A um, few more desirable criteria, I would put these as more highly desirable, uh, but not, but certainly not necessary in the sense of the other ones. Um, I've got a few here. One would be uh, the ability to contact, have a, have a contact. Um, for that data, the corresponding author essentially. Um, if you're publishing research, typically you'll have one author indicated um, with an email address or some contact information to reach that person for additional material, um, maybe additional permissions, maybe some clarification, um, maybe even potential partnerships uh, for future projects. So having having some contact information available um, where, where the data is published is, a, is an important, uh, but not necessarily critical aspect. When you're, you, when you're cataloging or describing that data, uh, this is very librarian oriented, but there, there are standards, there are standard vocabularies, there are standard uh, fields of description that you might want to make sure that you're adhering to, um, partially to make that data more findable, um, but also uh, just to, to enable the user to get a complete sense of what that, what, what that data entails. Um, there are standards for describing um, data sets, for describing particular types of data that, that you can take into account in order to um, kind of more completely describe and, and collect and label um, the data that, you're, that you might be using. Curation and description, that's what I talked about earlier with the landing page that kind of gives a sense of the overall, overarching project, provides linkages to the individual files and things like that. Um, that's pretty pretty simple one actually. The versioning, you know, you may have you may have collected this data over years and years and published it in in various versions and and making making the data available in the various versions that might exist, but also describing the differences between between the versions. Uh, that that can be a, a critical aspect, particularly let's say I as a user am grasping information from various sources, if you've got a version that relates to another another collection that you might have, 
I wouldn't necessarily want to duplicate that. I would want to understand um, what that what that data actually was and what how that version related to the previous ones if I was going to utilize that information. Pre-publication review um, sort of gets at the idea of being many many publishers um, are increasingly requiring that individuals share their data sets when they publish um, but there may or may not be a way to do that depending depending on on where you're depositing there may not be a way to do that that adheres to the double blind aspect right you may want to share the data with your reviewers so that they can kind of confirm your analysis or you know do a quick check and make sure that what you're saying holds for the data that you that you're looking at um, or they may just want you to to share it sometime post publication in which in which case the double blind doesn't come into play if if you are required to share that data um, you might you might need to to utilize a way to share that blindly without identifying yourself whereas if you were to just you know point them to your web page that's got your name and the study and the, your institution and everything then that sort of voids the double blind aspect so being able to to provide them with some sort of blinded pre-publication access to that data is, is another desirable. So I just want to point to a couple of examples, um, and I'll, I'll go in and, and show you uh, some of these. Um, Zenodo is a, a website that does a lot of scholarly sharing. They do um, open sharing of research publications, um, but they also do a pretty good job with data sets. And one of the things that, that I like about Zenodo is, is that they, they do enable the use of um, of those open licenses. So I'm going to point to that one specifically. Um, Google Google Scholar, Google there has a, has a specific data set indexing um, where they access multiple registries of data sets, um, anything that's sort of indicated in a government repository or a university repository that's labeled as a data set um, gets pulled into Google data sets. So you can, you can search those specifically. Um, the U.S. government has a number of repositories. Our own local um, institutional repository, our local faculty and student research archive, which up until now has, has done primarily publications, articles, posters, um, conference proceedings, and things like that. I am working with folks now to incorporate data sets uh, and publishing their data sets in SORA USA. So um, I want to change screens here for a second, but I want to make sure that I don't lose anything. So I'm changing to my browser. Make sure that you're seeing what, what I want you to see. So you should be seeing SORA USA here. If you're not, please speak up. I'm going to check chat real quick while I'm here. Sorry, I don't monitor my chat when I'm presenting very well. Um, open data can be used without special permission as long as it is cited and follows the CC conditions. Like statistics. Um, assuming that data has been has been given, um, that the permission has been given for that, then yes. Um, as long as you follow the conditions of the license under which it um, comes out. Um, G Power, I'm I'm not particularly familiar with. Um, so I might ask for a little more information on that if you'd like me to address it specifically. Um, I, I would say work with me regarding metadata. Um, if you're looking to locate metadata standards, um, the most of the data indexes that I'm familiar with are um, publicly available, so they're not necessarily through USA um, in, this, in the same sense that that some of the subscription databases um, for the for the published research literature are. Um, they tend to be more publicly available. Uh, emergency visits for a particular health condition. Is there healthcare open data when I can I can work with you to search um, particular uh, to locate particular data sets. I, I think going to um, some of the registries like Google Scholar, like um, Digital Commons Network like Zenodo are, are good places to start. Um, it, depending on what type of data you're looking for, um, we might find particular registries as well, but th that would that would really get into the weeds on specifics. Um, but I would be happy to work with you to, to locate something if that's if that's of interest to you. 
Um, so back to my browser. So is it here, this is this is one um, data set from Zenodo that I pulled. Uh, I just want to show you the kind of search screen here. So this was just a quick search that I did um, on wind energy. And I don't know why I chose wind energy, but I did. But you can see that some of these are presentations, some of these are data sets, some of these are posters. I'm not seeing that. I'm sorry. Let's try that again. How about now? Yes. Okay. Um, so you can see some of these are data sets, some of these are presentations, but I, I can choose one of the data sets and, and get a sense of, of how they've arranged. Um, I've talked about the sort of metadata and, and field description, so you can get a good sense of how they've arranged that. So they've got the title, they've got their authors or their creators of that particular data set, a brief abstract that describes the project, um, listing of any any funding, um, grant fund, uh, grant numbers that might be associated with that. Um, so theoretically, someone could say, I'm interested in viewing the data that's been collected under the European's Horizon 20 grant project, and they could pull up all the, all the grant funding numbers from that project and connect and, and search out the data. So that's, that's one angle on the findability that we talked about by listing and in incorporating the funder and, and the grant number, um, that's, that's another point of access for someone that might be interested in that data. Down along the left side, we show um, when that data was published. There has been a DOI assigned to that data set, a uh, certain number of keywords. This is one point. So keywords tends to be a sort of free and loose um, way of cataloging or tagging or describing a data set. Um, one of the ways that, that you might adhere to more metadata standards is utilizing something like uh, the National, National Library of Medicine's medical subject headings when you're doing some keyword descriptions or something like that. So that's one way that the metadata standards kind of come into play. Another way is just having a certain set of, of fields that you're providing information for. And we'll talk about that when I talk about a data plan. Um, Moving along, we've got um, communities that this might, sort of topical subjects groupings that this might be a part of, and most importantly, our Creative Commons license. So um, they not only list the Creative Commons license, they link directly to the CC Attribution 4.0 International license. I can click on that link and view the exact um, legal code and, and, and constraints on the use of that information. Uh, so clearly indicating, clearly providing access to the full description of the license um, to indicate to the user what they're allowed to do with it and what those conditions might be. Um, they do list versioning for this. Um, so you can see this is version 1.00. If they were to release a second version, they could relate that to this or list the different versions um, on the same on the same page. Uh, they list some basic citing information. They allow export under multiple um, potential um, data export formats. Um, so you can see uh, BibTeX, JSON. Uh, these are some standard citation um, exporting. So you could export that, the citation for that data very easily. And then each of the files, um, there's a, a, a single sort of preview that describes an overview of the, the data set it, itself here. And then there are the individual files um, that would be part of the data set. So you can see there's lots and lots of files associated with that. Ideally, each one of these would have additional information associated with it. So if we were to select um, one of these files, does it take us, looks like it takes us straight to the download. Um, so clicking on that just gives you the download and you've got this fairly, fairly randomly at least from our perspective, described file name. So I think this data set could use a little bit of description about what each of these files is and maybe a useful um, file name that actually describes describes what the what the data contains. But overall, uh, at least from from the from a sort of high high view, um, we get a good sense of, of what that data is from the abstract, the title, the descriptions. Um, 
not not so much from the file names, but the keywords and all of that gives us a good overview of that data and what's available there. I don't have a data set in SOAR just yet. Um, probably the next time I give this presentation, I will. But um, I, I wanted to show you um, what the Creative Commons thing looks like from this side of things. So um, if I were to access a particular landing page from, from here, um, you can see this is one of our student scholarly projects from the nursing program, but a data set would look very similar to this. We would have you know, document type and abstracts and, and things like that, but also we would be able to assign a DOI, we would be able to link to and, and indicate that, that usage license very clearly, um, and then we would have our, our downloads here as well. Um, plenty of plenty of room for for keyword description and and um, abstract and and file description and things like that here. Um, so we've we're we're working toward getting our our first data set published in SOAR, but that's that's an option as well. Uh, let's see what else did I have in here. Um, so I, before, I know I'm getting a little short on time, so very short on time, but I want to talk about data management plans. Um, really, you may, you may find yourself required to write a data management plan as part of certain grant funding applications, uh, but really these are simply outlining your project, outlining the roles for data management um, in a way that improves its publishability, increases the visibility of the data, um, increases the utility of the data, but it's a kind of pre-planning stage as, as you're planning your project that focuses on the types of data you'll collect, um, what types of obstacles you may run into with regard to privacy or um, intellectual property constraints, um, and allows you to make a plan that addresses that and with a view toward making that data potentially publicly available and, and open in the senses that we've described. Um, so that's what I mean by a data management plan, what goes into it. Um, very much, it's, it's a, a planning stage of what we just saw in terms of how that data is gonna be shared. So certainly descriptive, descriptive information about the data and what you're, which data you'll be sharing, which data might, um, might have to be sanitized for HIPAA or something like that. Um, what format do you plan to collect and release that data in? Um, what funding, publishing, or institutional mandates are you operating under, and how does that affect um, either what you're required to share or what you can't share? Um, maybe you need to filter out certain of that data um, that can't be shared for, for various reasons, but, but you're absolutely required to share certain data under your federal funding grant. Um, so addressing what needs to be shared, what can be shared, what you'd like to share, um, and getting a sense of that going into your project so that you can collect that, re that data in a way that allows for resharing, reuse, reaccess. The Another thing that would be a part of the data plan is, is that archiving and long-term long storage. So it, it's good to think about these things early in a project because you can uh, kind of work with your informed consent, let your let your patients know what you plan to do with the data, um, and make that a, a, a significant part of the informed consent. Um, if you want to have a constrained long-term storage, like you'll only keep the data for a year or two, um, that, that should be part of your data management plan as well, um, and certainly adhering to, to whatever it is that you indicate to your patients and from informed consent regarding their data um, you would want to adhere to in your, in your data management plan. Um, the other thing, the one thing on there that I think I missed was um, planning for roles of researchers. Um, how, who, who's responsible for collecting which data, um, who's responsible for maintaining the data beyond a certain point. You know, if you are required to pull that data as of a certain date, who's going to be monitoring that? Um, who's going to, who's going to write the cataloging? Who's going to, uh, who's going to be choosing and posting posting the data itself uh, and, and writing into your plan what 
which individuals and which roles are responsible for the various aspects of the data management. So that's kind of a, a very brief overview, but one thing that I want to point you to is the DMP tool. There's a couple of, of things online. Um, I find this one incredibly useful for a variety, for a couple of reasons. But this is essentially a data management planning um, online form. Let me know if you're not seeing my web screen here. I've, I've shifted and sometimes it doesn't cooperate. But the DMP tool allows you to create a data plan, um, guides you in uh, filling in some of the details of that plan, and, and also allows you to publish it to various registries. So initially, you'll start off with just a, a simple dashboard. Um, I can either go into a plan that I've got, or I can create a new one. Um, I'm going to create a new one and just call it sample one. Um, this is a mock project. so. I'm going to choose mock project that way it won't actually publish it to the to the uh, to the web it's just for my private educational or testing purposes um, but so in addition to you know titling that I can I can indicate my my research into organization if I am receiving funding and this is one of the things that I think is particularly useful let's say I'm getting funding from the National Institutes of Health then it would it'll it can provide me with a template to ensure that my data management plan adheres to those funding requirements. Um, so let's say we're not doing genomic planning. Let's just say we're doing a generic uh, National Institutes of Health plan. Um, so I can select a template, and then when I'm creating my plan, there will it will make sure that I'm addressing. All of the all of the individual points that that grant funder requires that I address in my data management plan. Uh, very simple stuff from the beginning, you know, sort of topical and description information, um, funding sources, um, grant numbers for that linkage and and findability that we talked about before. Um, collaborators, be your authors and things like that. The the key bits are going to be in the plan itself. Um, so a data sharing plan. And you can see for for any one of these oops, for any one of these fields, I've got some descriptive information from DMP itself. So how do we plan to provide access to our data? Just for example, um, I can get some prompts from DMP. I can get some descriptions of specifically what the National Institutes of Health expect to be in here. Um, so I can write this in to my data plan with specific requirements of NIH in mind. Um, there's, you know, there's definitely lots of these individual fields and you can see how how and when will you make the data, data available, which repositories are you, are you planning to put it in, um, will there be a data sharing agreement. So really it just walks you through every point by point aspect that's, that's at least at least the ones that are critical to NIH. Um, indicate which ones would be there and, and give some guidance in that regard. Um, once you've completed that, you can you can add your 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 actual files. Um, so this is really soup to nuts. Not only the planning process, <coughs> but also sharing that information. And once once you've once you finalize that, then you can um, you can choose to to make that public through the DMP um, registry itself. Um, see, I, I can't do that because I haven't answered enough of the questions here. Um, they do require that you have a fairly complete data plan before you publish it. And then you can you can publish it to the registry and share it through your ORCID account and provide multiple links to individuals that want to find that. Um, but the I think it's a, a very useful tool for getting an overview of what goes into a, a data plan, um, allowing someone who has very little familiarity with data planning to to write a fairly comprehensive one and with the guidance and, and the prompts and the templates from the individual grant funders I think it provides a very useful way of addressing uh, the specific needs of, of any particular grant funding that you might be required to adhere to. So that's the DMP tool and I believe that is where I end. So I just want to make myself available. I know um, I went through a lot of information fairly rapidly um, but if you do have any questions, you can certainly contact me. Uh, my information's up there. Um, but I'll take a minute to, to address any additional questions. I didn't see anything else pop up in chat. 
So maybe one. Check that real quick. Good. Yes, please um, feel feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to help you locate additional um, registries. Maybe if you're looking to find a, a good place to to register your data, um, Sora at USA is a, a great place that has a lot of uh, sort of networked pointing to that information. Um, but if you wanted to store it in SOAR and point to it from other registries, that's a, that's also a possibility. If you're looking to identify data sets, I'd be happy to work with you to find, to find additional data as well. Um, but other than that, I thank you for coming out. Um, if there's no other questions, I'll turn you loose and say good night.